there's like this massive controversy primarily on social media about the use of manual therapy in physical therapy. And I feel like it's turned into this complete messy dogmatic approach. Like if you do only use manual therapy, you're not a good PT. Our Duke Center of Excellence in Manual and Manipulative Therapy was basically created as a site to reduce the misinformation that we were mm -hmm. seeing on manual therapy. Both there are hundreds of studies that demonstrate that manual therapy has similar or superior outcomes against its comparators. But you're right, there's a lot of uh, negativity on social media and it's difficult to ignore it. Welcome to In the ED Now, a podcast that makes you an excellent emergency department physical therapist. Today, we're interviewing Dr. Chad Cook about the use of manual therapy in the emergency department. Manual therapy has gotten a little controversial in our profession. Today, we're going to talk about why that is, how we can utilize this in our skill set, and what benefits there are for our patients. Don't miss this episode of In the ED Now. Welcome back to In the ED Now. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Griffith, the ED DPT, and this is a podcast to make you an excellent emergency department physical therapist. I have with me today, Dr. Chad Cook. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really uh, happy to be here. I'm super excited to talk to you today. I know that you have a lot to contribute. So what I would ask first is, can you tell people three things they think that you think that they should know about you before we dive into what we're going to talk about? Uh, I guess... I was a clinician for 10 years before I got into academia, so I, I think I understand what it's like for the day-to-day -day grind of a PT. Um, I treat all the patients in my trials right now, so that's where I get, you know, I get, I get the understanding of how something works by actually working with the patients in the studies. And the third one, um, I, uh, I've been a PT for 33 years. Oh, that's amazing. So what would you say is your favorite part about being a PT? I think, and it, and it took me a while to, to learn this, is just it's so unpredictable and mm -hmm. something new every day. And you're never going to be perfect, but you can always strive to be perfect. So, you know, it always gives you an aspiration, I think, as a profession. I think you just probably perfectly summarize what it's like to work in the emergency department every day as well, right? Like you never know what's going to happen. You've got to be flexible. You're not going to be your best and the, you can just show up and try again the next time. So that's perfect. So your research really focuses around manual therapy. Is that correct? It's one of the areas. Yes. I, I think people know me a lot from uh, the manual therapy research. I do have uh, two relatively large grants in that area right now, but I do research in a lot of different areas, but definitely manual therapy is one of them. Awesome. So you're definitely a researcher and you're in academia, but not in the emergency department. But we're going to talk today about manual therapy, when we should use that in the emergency department, and really what that means. Sound like plan? And I will lean on you on some of the specifics for the emergency department because you're right. I'm. I'm. That's not my setting, and uh, I've I've had some experience by working with an ED physician, but uh, I'm definitely going to lean on you on that. Perfect. So let's start by saying what really is considered manual therapy, because I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions about what manual therapy is, what it isn't. I, I had did a course in October about manual therapy and acute care and had some neurotherapists in that course. And they were like, well, I never do manual therapy. But at the end, we kind of talked about maybe manual therapy is not just limited to what you think it is, but you're actually involved in work to define that. So can you share with us what that means? I am. So we have an NIH U24 called ForceNet, and it's a relatively large grant. It's a five-year grant, about $3 million. And one of the projects within the grant is, it's a taxonomy project in defining what manual therapy is. And the the, the challenge is, is that it its definition is different depending on who you talk to. Right. And, and NIH is, wants to have a very inclusive definition. So they want to include everything into manual therapy. And then you get selected groups like AOMPT or IFOMPT who want to really narrow that definition down to a specific category. So the best way to answer it is manual therapy is, well, it depends on who you talk to. And so I, I think it's the use of hands, skilled use of hands for therapeutic application. 
And that can be anything. That can be stretching. That can be mobilization. can be manip manipulation. It can be therapeutic touch. Yes. All of these things factor in and to that. Other people, like I said, are more restrictive. They, they factor in the training piece. They factor in a clinical reasoning piece. A more open definition is purely about application, any technique that involves hands-on. I think it still needs to be tightened up. Um, so to answer your question on what is manual therapy, it depends. Um, again, I think perfect PT answer. <laughs> it's a typical PT error answer for sure. But I th I do think it's skilled application um, with your hands for a therapeutic reasoning. I think that's perfect. And and when I think about the way that I use manual therapy in the hospital setting, whether that's in the emergency department or in the ICU, I, I feel like I touch every patient. And whether that's neuromuscular facilitation, whether that's therapeutic activities where I'm trying to facilitate the quality of movement for a transfer, I am using my hands to guide their body physically. And that's manual hands-on therapy. But in the emergency department specifically, we have so many patients who come in with really high levels of pain, high acuity, high sensitivity, high irritability. And sometimes that's maybe not the time that we just do exercise. That's maybe not the time that we only do education. What is it that we can do that's not pharmacological with our hands, with our skills to really help those patients? Well, I agree. And actually, not just me, but NIH would agree too. I mean, they're looking for non-pharmacological mechanisms to treat patients who are in a lot of pain and who have different types of pain experiences. And certainly manual therapy factors in on that because it's ex extremely safe. It is extremely effective. And it can work in multiple situations. So I'm in a full agreement. I, I think that's a, and the way you described it too, the fact that you put your hands on patients, there's actually work that's been done by George Estefas out of Malta. And there is value to therapeutic touch. It actually has an effect. And if you think about these patients that are struggling a long time, they often struggle socially. There are a number of other things going on. Just having a caring clinician that puts their hands on them and helps them work through selected types of movements, through passive interventions. I mean, it may be a nice segue to doing things later on with the patient. I think it absolutely is. And I think it's it's helps build confidence as well, particularly if a movement is really fearful to you. If somebody is like guiding you and moving you through that, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's just like when our kids are learning to cross the street, we hold their hand and guide them. It's the same. I think of it as the same way. I think the other thing with patients who come into the emergency department is I have so many patients. No one ever touches them. They might be completely isolated. They might be unhoused. They might live alone. They might be elderly. They go see their physician. They don't get a hands-on exam. Uh, I have so many patients that say, you're the first one who's touched me. Yeah, I hear that a lot too. And and it's unfortunate, I think, because I think there's great value in that. I think your hands can identify selected things that you won't just identify through uh, you know, a standardized test or your eyes. Um, I, I Again, when I, I want to reinforce the fact that it's not just us, it's other entities. The VA is also highly supportive of the use of non-pharmacological me mechanisms for treating musculoskeletal problems. And veterans themselves, when they've been surveyed, are really looking for different options. And, and manual therapy is one of the options they're looking for. I totally agree. So my next question is, how do you know when to use it? Because I think we've all who practice in the ED have had that patient where we've tried manual therapy and maybe made that patient worse. Now they're screaming. Now they're like, don't touch me. I, I mean, and I'm recovering from a surgery right now. And there are times where I'm like, please don't touch me. Like the last thing I want is for somebody to touch me in any way. So how, what does the literature say that we should do when trying to choose who best to use these patients with? I, I understand it's dependent, but is there any guidance there? There is some. And, and I'll preface it by saying when it comes to any type of treatment that we decide to use with a patient, there is no perfect algorithm that's going to tell us who's going to succeed with exercise or with surgery or with cognitive behavioral therapy or with manual therapy. So it's in the same boat as everything else. Mm -hmm. There are some key features that come up in the examination that suggest a person might benefit. 
Certainly one of them is if they've had past experience with manual therapy that's been positive, mm. then, then typically that is a good uh, transition to the use of it. Patient preference is one that really drives it. If a person is saying, you know, if somebody could just get in there and work this, that's usually suggestive that there's a potentially good outcome. Our work has looked at um, what we term um, pain adaptability. And that's where if you start to move them, whether it be passively or actively, they often have a reduction of pain, a fairly notable reduction of pain, up to 30%. In other words, they really respond well to movement. They have done well with the manual therapy application as well. And it doesn't mean that, that only manual therapy is likely to benefit them. They probably would do well with an active approach too, but that wasn't studied in our works. Uh, I think we had five or six studies. We looked at that. We only looked at manual therapy and, and they seemed to do better if they had that adaptable uh, sign to them. Those are the big things right now. Some of the cardinal things that we had learned in the past historically, like if they're stiff, you should use manual therapy or if they're this, that, or the other, those haven't really panned out mm. um, with modern science. Um, so unfortunately, a lot of it is um, try and see if it works and then match it with patient preferences. I think that's great. I, the other the other caveat that I have for that is in the emergency department. If we are providing manual therapy to patients and it's really successful and they feel better, we don't always have somewhere to send them to continue that treatment. So how would you best kind of communicate with a patient about the benefits of manual therapy versus how they can kind of continue that on their own? I think there are two directions. First of all, in probably you know this more than I, that understanding what community resources you have so you can send that person to there, that, that's imperative. So matching them with providers you know are going to give quality hands-on care. Mm -hmm. Someone you've had experience before that understands that they need to get them in quickly and need to follow up with that process well. That That is certainly the first piece to that because one visit of manual therapy is not really going to make a huge difference. Right. Um, it's going to give us an understanding of who may benefit from it but the mechanisms typically are short term. And often, if you look at the studies, the observational studies, they suggest about five visits tends to be the peak. And then you get a point of diminishing returns after that. The second part is, is that we really need to instruct our patients in an augmented approach where they can do their home exercise program, which models what you're doing with them in the clinic. So something similar, if you're working on a certain neck movement or rotation or something, send them home with a similar strategy that has the same pain modulatory component. Our research on adherence to home exercise program has shown that patients adhere to programs that have a similar pain modulatory component that they receive mm -hmm. in the clinic. And if it doesn't, they don't think it has value and they don't do it. So oh, okay. matching it like that, I think is also really important. So we're not necessarily building our home exercise program just on what movements we want to see, maybe not just on what needs to be strengthened, but also on what's going to provide that like pain modulation so that they have that reward that they get with those movements. Absolutely. That's what the research we did out of Bell and College showed. And it's essentially that those who stop doing their home exercise program, either the exercise program itself, contextually, they didn't understand it. They didn't see the value in it or it didn't modulate their pain. Those were the two big reasons they didn't do it. Yeah, and I think about that too, when I see um, patients come in with home exercise programs that are like, well, I, I'm already seeing a PT and there's like 15 exercises. And I'm like, and I'm doing all of these and I don't know why it's not working. And I look at it and I'm like, dang, like this is, first of all, it's a lot. Second of all, I don't know that it's it's getting right where we need you to be. But then on the other hand, I have patients who they don't really have a safe place to do home exercises. So I have to really think about what techniques are going to give them the most value. Do they have a place where they can perform that? And I'm thinking about what you said about like cervical rotation, for example, could easily give somebody something that would match with that manual therapy component that would be able or available for them to do wherever they are. And we published a paper on this. Actually, we measured to see if there's value in that augmented approach. And it has an effect size of about 0.15, which would be considered trivial to small. But when you're dealing with musculoskeletal issues, I think any additional effect is always going to be welcomed, especially on challenging patients that might end up in an ED. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right about that. 
I think the other thing that we've noticed in the emergency department is that if we see a patient in the ED, they're much more likely to follow up in a physical therapy clinic as an outpatient than if they were just given a referral from the ED by a physician. They're much more likely to actually make it to that next appointment. And I think this is some of why is that they get that immediate success, that buy-in, that education. They get that plan and they get that hope that there will be resolution versus if they just speak to a physician and they're like, oh, no, you should see the physical therapist. There isn't that same connection and that same um, vision of value. Well, first of all, I love hearing that. And that that's the first I've actually heard of that. That's fantastic news. Um, secondly. I completely understand and I agree with that. Um, I know that the ED docs here at Duke, even when they offer free services and when they make recommendations, they often don't see those patients coming back. Right. Um, so I think they have to have a little dose of this is likely what you're going to experience. And, you know, something like manual therapy, which is very high on the patient satisfaction, high on the patient preference list, I can see where that might be a carryover effect toward continued interventions because you and I both know one visit, one visit for anything, right? It typically isn't enough. And so one visit of manual therapy isn't going to fix somebody. Right. Manual therapy by itself isn't recommended in any of the clinical practice guidelines anyway. Right. So it has to be a multimodal approach, involves behavioral change, et cetera. And that's going to take a little bit more, I think, than an ED visit. I think you're absolutely right because those patients really need to know that there's hope, that there's a plan. They need to understand that it's not a one and done as well. So many patients that come into the emergency department are kind of at their wits end and they're ready for resolution. And some of that is they don't have access to care in other ways. And some of it is that they're, they've just been dealing with it for so long. Like we might get that patient who's like, well, I've had back pain for 30 years. And you're like, well, why are you here today? Like, what is it about today? Well, I can't take it anymore. Got it. Let's see what we can do from here. So my next question is, is a little bit about that. When you're working with a patient and you think manual therapy is indicated, but they're like, their symptoms are irritable. Their behavior is escalated. They're agitated. They're nervous. They're um, scared. How would you go about educating that patient on what manual therapy is and um explaining to them that to them in a way that would get their buy-in. Yeah. So I'll try to unpack that. I, so I'm a believer that if a person isn't ready for it, they're not ready for it. And Love I will, and, and I'm trying to push something on somebody. Um, and I know a lot of people externally think that I probably do manual therapy on everyone and I absolutely do not. And just like I don't do pain education for everybody and I don't do, you know, a certain type of exercise for everybody. It really depends on the patient. So if someone is unsure about manual therapy, I will walk them through what we know about its mechanisms. It is a very powerful pain modulator, it tends to be short term, but it does work very well, both peripherally and centrally in the brain to reduce a person's pain experience. It has some neuroimmune effects, probably not enough to change you know, any type of disease process. It has an inflammatory component, especially locally, which works in conjunction with pain modulation. It's likely one of the reasons we see a reduction of pain in individuals. It has a muscle spindle component. It actually has a performance component that's been studied quite a bit as well. Mm -hmm. So all of these things together, along with the contextual piece, if a person believes in it, it has a, a wellness factor to it. It, it leads to cannabinoids and endorphin release. And there's some research around dopamine release with massage. So there's quite a bit of mechanisms research in manual therapy that shows that it has a relevant effect. I often say it's, it's kind of like the ibuprofen of a physical therapist. It has that mm -hmm. similar effect in an individual. And if you're looking for that, we can give it a try. If it's something you're not, um, you know, you're not interested in, we've got other avenues to go. I think that's perfect. The The only things I would add to that um, is working with patients on sort of like de-escalating that behavior to the point where they can attend to what you're saying. So one analogy that I use often is that before you can put gas in your car, you have to turn the car off. So I will work with patients on like how can we like breathe through the pain? How can we be present? How can we get that nervous system 
to come down a few notches before we try education, before we try touching a patient. So before I do anything to them, how can I help them get their engine off mm -hmm. before I ask for anything from them or do anything to them? But I think your explanation is perfect on like, this is why I want to do this. This is how this works. And this is why I think it will help you. And I think that that gets skipped a lot in the medical system. I think it gets skipped a lot in the emergency department where we just say, next, you're going to have a CT scan. Then we're going to draw your blood and then we're going to give you this pill. And then we're going to discharge you. Like, it's very much like, this is what's going to happen to you. And I don't feel like we give patients enough autonomy or choice in that situation. Yeah. I mean, if you think about true patient-centered care, one of the roles that we play is the ability to describe what the intervention does. Yeah. And I think that's, I, I was thinking about, I was reflecting on my career and the different steps in growth. And I think the most recent growth step has my, my ability to actually describe what, what our interventions do. Mm. And when I've listened to some clinicians try to describe it, they're just like, well, you know, it's supposed to increase range of motion. Well, that's not really describing what it does. Right. Um, I think being able to be more granular in explaining what happens and what has been studied, what we know about it, I think those are valuable things to patients. And uh, so, and I totally agree with you. I love your, um, you you treat a different patient population. For than, sure. <laughs> than are involved in my, in my research study. So, you know, hearing you and how you, um, your analogy there, I love hearing that. I'm no, no surprise to me that you won the innovation award at AOPT on that. I just love what you're doing. I, I called you, a, I think, a trailblazer on Twitter. And I, I really think, um, I really think you're, you've got a great niche here and you're going to be, you're going to be changing practice. Well, I appreciate that. One thing that I say to my outpatient orthopedic colleagues is you've never seen a patient with acute low back pain. I know you think you have, yeah, but I don't think you actually have. So until you've seen a patient who's stuck in prone, screaming on a gurney, had to be picked up by six burly guys to get into the emergency department and is screaming despite pain medication. Let, let's talk then. And then you tell me like how all of this works. But I actually find sometimes those are the, the most satisfying patients to work with because the delta is huge. The mm -hmm. delta of change that you can make in that short period of time is huge. And then I think about those downstream effects. Like if I can get that person up, moving and safe and ready to go today, think how much better they'll be than if that person goes home and spends the next two weeks in bed because they're afraid to move. Brilliant. Yeah, totally agree. I've heard Mark Lazlett tell stories about this too, because he sees a, and occasionally we'll see a true acute low back pain person comes in in a gurney or in, in a wheelchair or something and and you see the dramatic change in them. And you're right, I, I, I've never seen that population. Yeah, and when I think about what you said about the, the patients in your research studies, I think the other issue is I read literature and I look and especially in my fellowship program, I'm like, wow, these inclusion criteria are never patients that I will see. Yep. And that these patients fit so beautifully in this box and my patients have never seen the box. So uh, it's hard to take that. Um, so I'm going to ask you a bonus question. It's hard to take that information from the literature and then apply it to people who are completely outside of that. So how do you recommend that people like myself who are in practice take the research, the beautiful research that you're doing, and then apply it in a meaningful way? Well, I mean, it's, it's going to be a lazy answer, but basically okay. what I say is, is take what works for you take the bits and pieces that are tangible to your area of practice and use those. But you just have, to, in many cases, you have to, you have to punt. You have to basically get in there and, and figure out, okay, I got to try something new. Let's try this. And you have to be the one that builds that pattern of care. If that, if that pattern isn't present in the literature. So yeah. that, that's what I tell people. And, you're right, though. Research is so limiting, right, with the inclusion exclusion criteria, the specific groups we look at. Even with precision medicine, we're trying to winnow it down even further now. Yes. Um, I think we're going to continue to move away from these populations. And I, I think true population health, the ED patient, has just been ignored for a musculoskeletal and how to manage this person as a PT. 
I think you're right. And I think the, the amount of information that other healthcare professionals get around the musculoskeletal system is so limited. It's so much an afterthought in many types of education that the, the diagnostic approach that I often see is box, 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 box. And if, if you don't fit neatly into any of these boxes, we're going to just shove you in the box and close the top anyway and hope for the best. So I think having physical therapists specifically in the emergency department kind of hope helps blow that up a little. So we get people the care that they need. Totally agree. And I'm a boxer. I'm one of these uh, researchers that try to box patients or try to classify patients and uh, with marginal success so far. Well, I think that we need that though. And there are people doing, starting to do some of that research in the emergency department specifically. So there's a large trial going on at Northwestern right now about a low back pain pathway for physical therapists in the emergency department with Dr. Howard Kim. So I'll be really excited to see how that turns out. They're doing one for vertigo as well. So I think it, it's just in the emergency department, it's so hard to standardize anything, um, especially patients' experiences. I agree. And I, I got to tell you, just the nature of who I am, a very structured person who likes a schedule and I don't know how you do it. <laughs> well, I do tell people that when I'm talking about like, if they're like, oh, that sounds cool. I'm like, oh, if you like routine, this is not for you. If you like yep. to know what tomorrow is going to look like, this is not for you. If you want to eat at 12 o'clock, this is, this is maybe not for you. But for me, looking at a schedule for the rest of my week and knowing that I'm going to be treating like low back pain, knee replacement, ankle sprain, like to me, that just sounds like not very fun. But not knowing what you're going to walk into, I think is super exciting. So I think that's one of the best parts. All right. I've got one more question for you. Okay. Because I feel like I would be remiss not to ask because it's such a kind of trending topic right now in PT. There's like this massive controversy primarily on social media about the use of manual therapy in physical therapy. And I feel like it's turned into this complete messy dogmatic approach. Like if you don't use manual therapy, then you're not a good PT. If you do only use manual therapy, you're not a good PT. And this is all dogma and nothing really matters. And how we treat patients doesn't matter. Like, what would you say to all that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's certainly something that has been present, I think, for the last decade. And um, it's very pervasive. Um, our Duke Center of Excellence in Manual and Manipulative Therapy was basically created as a site to reduce the misinformation that we were mm -hmm. seeing on manual therapy, both, both extremes, by the way, the extremes yeah. of, you know, the weird stuff over here, and, but also the, you know, should never use manual therapy over here. And I've seen it kind of morph over the last decade or so, you know, in, initially there was a lot of discussion such as, well, there's no evidence to support manual therapy, which is completely untrue. There are hundreds of studies that demonstrate that manual therapy has similar or superior outcomes against its comparators. And the comparators are multiple types, hundreds of studies. So the, the story has changed now, and now it's more about manual therapists or elitists, or they're, you know, they're focused on theories that are 50 to 100 years old, or they claim this is what, or, or they conflate, you know, their examination results to the particular outcomes they see. And there's some truth to that. Um, I think there is a slow plotting change in the way that we're trained in manual therapy. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it's been a positive change. I think it will continue to change over time. Um, that part has probably been a useful aspect of the criticism around manual therapy. But I, I will say this, and I've said this a hundred times in the hundred different platforms I've been given to talk about this. This does not mean we should stop using manual therapy in the clinic. That's ridiculous. Um, if we stop using it, somebody will backfill that and take our place because it's useful. It has clinical effectiveness and patients want it. Yes. And it's safe and it's cost effective. So there's no reason not to use it. But you're right. There's a lot of uh, negativity on social media and it's difficult to um, ignore it. Um, but, you know, everybody has their own strategy on how to manage that. So. Yeah, I just think it must be so confusing for students and new grads who are hearing things in their education, they've seen things in their training, and then they come out and there's like all these people fighting about what makes you a good PT and what makes you a bad PT. And I think it's it's really like kind of a sad message, particularly when our patients are seeing that discordance as well. 
But I, for me, I think the bottom line for me is, what do we always say? We say it depends. Mm -hmm. And that's like, if, if you were going to sum physical therapy school up in a, in a tagline, like a hashtag, hashtag it depends, that's the answer. And the way that I talk to students about practicing in the emergency department is you are going to need all of your toolkit. You will need every tool in your toolbox. You just don't know how you're going to apply it. And the emergency department is different, like we talked about, because our patients don't fit in boxes. And so when we see those patients, what I need you to be able to do is to use your familiar tools in unfamiliar ways, in an unfamiliar setting with unfamiliar patients and put it all together and that you can't just rely on one set of tools for each patient because the needs of each patient, particularly once you pull in social determinants of health, trauma-informed care, and the amount of time and impact that you have on that patient, I think it's actually negligence to not consider using all of the skills that we have. Amen. 100% agree. So that's and the soapbox. You need all your yeah. tools. Yeah. Yes. And that's what critical thinking is. And that's what makes us doctors of physical therapy. When we use that critical thinking with our toolkit to apply it to the human in front of us. That's right. Uh, it's, I, to me, it's stunning to, for someone to say, I never use manual therapy. I, I just, that's ridiculous. And it, yeah. yeah. And I never, ever, like I never is, is a weird thing in PT. I never. Yeah, no. Just that. It, 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 some people ask me, well, what tool do you feel is not that useful? My, uh, my answer to that is, it depends. I mean, all tools are useful on the right patient. And I want to have as many options as I can get because managing people with musculoskeletal problems is difficult. Yes. I, I heard somebody in a presentation recently, he said, if you treat all of your patients the same way and you do your job the same way and you don't learn and you don't grow and you don't individualize the care that you're providing, have you practiced for 20 years or have you practiced the same year 20 times? <laughs> so true. And I yeah. thought, oh, wow. Like, I need to not be stagnant. I need to continue to grow. I need to continue to learn. And I need to continue to expand my toolbox so that the patients who are learning, growing, changing, in this weird context of society that we have, get the care that they need. And, you know, I'm a big fan of precision medicine and the precision medicine initiative says you treat each patient individually for what they need. And what one patient needs is not going to be what another patient needs. Yeah. It's not as um, algorithm based as we'd like it to be. It's too complicated. It would be way easier if it was. Yep but not as magical and not as fun. So on that note, what would you leave people with at the end of this talk? That manual therapy can be an effective tool. And with when used on the right patient, there unfortunately, there's no easy mathematical checklist that you can look at that tells you which patient is the right patient. I think you need to communicate with your, your patient to find out what they're looking for. Incorporate it into a treatment program. It doesn't need to be the only thing. And then find someone who understands it, that has good training, and have that person apply it, especially if you're in an ED setting and you're the conductor. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get them connected. I love it. And if people are thinking, gosh, I really need to up my game, what would you suggest they do? Well, there are a lot of different options. Um, certainly, there are training programs out there, independent con ed related training programs. There are training programs through MedBridge. And if you really wanted to up your game, there are fellowship programs, yeah, that's a number of programs <laughs> that are out there. And um, and it's a, a very formative study um, that's typically about two years. And those individuals get out, and when I said it, AOMT, with a depth of manual therapy knowledge, but mm -hmm. with a very strong laterality of knowledge on other factors too. It's not just sitting around and learning how to do techniques. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, my fellowship registration was definitely a pandemic purchase. Some people got puppies. Some people started sourdough. I started a fellowship. Um, but everybody makes choices. I'm learning so much, though. And I think to your point, it's not just manual therapy. It's really um, critical thinking and a way yeah. to think about the patient in front of you. Well, thank you so much for being with us. You've been in the ED now, and you're officially discharged. I appreciate that. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for listening. In the ED Now is a podcast hosted and produced by Rebecca Griffith, the ED DPT, as part of Rebecca Griffith Physical Therapy, LLC. Our podcast makes you an excellent emergency department physical therapist. This podcast is intended for educational use only and is not intended as clinical or medical advice. While we make every effort for accuracy, factual errors may be present. Since you've been in the ED, I'm prepared to give you your discharge instructions. Please subscribe, share, and find more at the eddpt.com. You're officially discharged.